All right, so this is the last lecture thinking about temporal ecology. So I wanted to kind of end up thinking about um, some of the research I've done at looking at community disassembly. So it's, um, you know, kind of like the opposite process of community assembly. And we're going to be talking about this in the context of ephemeral ecosystems. So um, there's a, a really a pretty famous uh, review paper looking at uh, these assembly rules that we've talked about. Um, it was in the journal Oikos, and um, it kind of set out formally what we should think about with what assembly rules are. And um, uh, remember that these assembly rules are uh, things that determine how species combine to form a community. Now, probably the you know, three most common one is that uh, it's expected that niche overlap should be minimized. All niches are filled before the niches start overlapping. And then uh, the proportion of species from different guilds remains constant. So go back to, you know, we, we can see all of those things in those specific rules that we talked about um, in our last lecture. Um, now, community disassembly then is um, thinking about, you know, how a community basically falls apart as species are lost. So um, the non-random process of progressive species declines and losses. And what, when we think about that, what we see is that species traits determine the vulnerability of whether it will disappear from the community. And um, if you want to look at uh, a, a really good paper about community disassembly, you can, this Zavaleta paper, where she was looking at how the whole ecosystem responds to community disassembly. Now, when we think about community disassembly, though, it's oftentimes talked about in the context of permanent ecosystems due to things like uh, invasive species, uh, fragmentation of permanent rainforest. This is a uh, disturbance, so a, a really, a really big storm. Um, so how species are lost after, you know, I, I believe this is after a hurricane here. Um, and then with climate change. So as global warming progresses, we're losing species due to, you know, too warm of temperatures in certain places, right? Now, all of these things are in permanent ecosystems and, you know, like one-time events, really. Like, um, I guess maybe hurricanes aren't um, one-time events, but drastic things happening to, to the ecosystem. Um, so when we think about uh, communities disassembly in permanent ecosystems, um, there's oftentimes very unpredictable outcomes. Okay, think about every system, every single ecosystem type. Um, we expect to act differently. Every single taxonomic group, right? So if we think about, you know, in a all sorts of different types of organisms, they're going to very much respond differently to something like habitat fragmentation. Um, and then there, you know, each individual ecosystem has specific environmental or geographic context that will be unique to that specific area. But through this work, what we've pretty much seen now is that um, there are some parents. Trophic position, things higher on the food web, uh, you know, higher on the food chain tend to disappear first, larger bodied tend to disappear more easily, and things that can't disperse, things that can't move tend to go away quicker. So if you're a big, uh, slow moving predator, you're screwed, right? And um, so that's why we see things like, you know, wolves are very, um, you might think that a wolf is relatively mobile, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not that mobile compared to, uh, you know, other like flying organisms and things like that. Now, um, but I work in ephemeral wetlands. And the thing about ephemeral wetlands is right here, here is kind of the border of the wetland. You can kind of see it right there, right? Um, and this 
essentially any type of ephemeral wetland kind of by definition goes through these assembly and disassembly processes all the time. Every time there is a hydro period, the community has to assemble. Now, maybe not from scratch because there's a lot of resting eggs and things, but then the community has to disassemble as the, the, the habitat essentially goes away. And so the, um, these are fairy shrimp here. Um, so, so these are fairy shrimp. These are tadpole shrimp. Um, and these are clam shrimp down here. And all three of these different organisms, uh, and you know, there's lots of species of fairy, there's lots of, sp well, there's a couple of species of tadpole shrimp, but there's lots of species of clam shrimp, um, not only are adapted to um, water going away completely, like they're an aquatic organism, but they're adapted to water going away, but not just adapted to it, they require it. For their eggs to actually hatch out, they need a dry period for those eggs to dry out and get exposed to um, certain conditions such that when the water returns, they'll hatch out. So we can think of ephemeral systems when you have the hydro period here, um, you have this assembly followed by a community disassembly every single time um, there's water there. So um, this, the uh, Balias and Lancaster's uh, paper in Oikos kind of put together how we should think about assemb assembly rules. And um, a lot of assembly rules kind of just found patterns, observed assembly pattern, and just left it at that. But what they wanted to do was look at a mechanism that created a rule that then made an observable pattern. Um, so you shouldn't have a, um, you know, just a pattern that we see or say that this is, you know, what we would expect in uh, an assembly scenario. You need to have that mechanism. Um, so what I did was thinking about um, community disassembly, I wanted to put it into this kind of framework. So what I was thinking about was creating a or finding a mechanism in, um, that, that happens in ephemeral wetlands, making a disassembly rule that caused the pattern, and then we could make predictions from that and go about um, thinking about how, how this um, you know, we can, from those specific predictions, we can make, um, do experiments to see if this, this pattern is actually caused by that mechanism. So the thing is, all of these things that I'm going to be talking about are heuristic, meaning they're meant to be changeable. Um, I'm just making predictions and that other people can go out and test or, uh, and some of my research that I'm currently working on is testing those ideas. And this isn't meant to work for everything, right? Uh, it's not meant to work for every type of ephemeral ecosystem. Um, what I'm really trying to concentrate on is like ephemeral water bodies themselves. So when we think about, you know, a, a how does a water body fundamentally change? So a, a pool, a, a basin fills up with water, and then what happens when it goes away? So I want to think about three basic mechanisms. The pool gets smaller, the habitat gets harsher, things like oxygen levels really go down, temperature swings can get really crazy, pH swings can get really crazy. Um, and then the whole meta-community collapses. So those are the three mechanisms I'm going to talk about and we're going to s try to look at some of the patterns and disassembly rules that we could make from that. So what happens when a pool a ephemeral water body gets smaller. Well, one other thing is that microhabitats are eliminated. So when specific, so, so in this example here, what we have is, um, you know, tiny little offshoot habitats alongside the pool where this yellow species can, uh, can survive. Now, as that pool dries up and gets, loses water, you know, those offshoot little pools along the side would be, those shallow water pools would go away first and we then, you know, have a smaller, um, smaller pool where those, then that yellow species goes away. So 
we would expect um, in the later stages of the disassembly, you would have less diversity. So that's real easy to check check just look at diversity does diversity go down and you know I'm not just saying like from the time it has water and the, from the time when it doesn't have water because obviously we're not going to have any aquatic species when it's just a bunch of dirt but you know it should pr progressively um, decrease in diversity as the pool then goes away again uh, encounter rates should increase. Now what I'm talking about is encounter rates is basically how often does one species bump into another. And because you're taking essentially the same number of species and putting them in a smaller pond, they should bump into each other more often. So predation rates should increase, right? Um, predators will be able to find each other more often, or the predators will be able to be bumping into prey more often. Um, and what I've seen is that um, uh, wading birds, so uh, like rails um, and avocets and all, all sorts of uh, these wading birds, will um, really concentrate their predation on macroinvertebrates on smaller pools where you know, if it's a really turbid, muddy water, they can't see um, to the bottom very easily. But a smaller pool, they'll be able to do that. Um, and then larger organisms are more able to be seen, especially in a smaller, uh, shallower habitat. So we might expect uh, the species of like armored, uh, the, the species that have like armor against predation to the, them go up. So through the disassembly scenario, um, you'd expect the like species resistant to predation to really increase. And then because uh, organisms are bumping into each other more often, we would expect things like diseases and parasites to really um, increase, um, get uh, transmitted all the way around um, much, much easier. So then as the habitat then um, gets smaller, it also gets harsher. So that's again things like oxygen, um, chemical differences, pH, um, temperature swings, amount of UV radiation penetrating in through that water. Um, it all makes the habitat a lot harsher and harder to live in. So uh, what we would expect then is lower, lowest tolerant species to be eliminated first. So if you have you know, a, a species with a range, a bunch of different species with a range of oxygen tolerances, those species that have, um, you know, that need a lot of oxygen, we expect them to go away first. Um, and, you know, uh, kind of like a side pattern that we might expect is that the immigration ability, the ability to leave, essentially, so, you know, emigration is leaving, right, um, negatively correlates with tolerance range. So we can see that, let's say, where we have, um, you know, a, a species that has a narrow tolerance and a broad tolerance. Now, um, if you have a broad tolerance, uh, you can basically live in uh, water that has a lot of oxygen or very little oxygen. You don't need to be a, a, a really good disperser, right? You, you can be a bad disperser. Whereas if you have a really narrow tolerance, well, yeah, if you're going to live in these ephemeral habitats, you better be able to move around and find a good, uh, good place uh, very easily. So an example of that is like a lungfish, right? A lungfish can survive essentially not having water at all by burrowing in the sediments and creating this encapsulation, encapsulated thing around it compared to um, this diving bug uh, that, um, you know, the, the, the adults can just fly wherever they want. Um, and they have, they, 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 you know, they need a good amount of water. They're, they're relative, this species particularly is relatively big, about three inches long. Um, so they need to be able to um, have a decent amount of water. And the way they find that is just by flying wherever they need to go. So we could, we could kind of test this to see if that emigration ability does negatively correlate with tolerance range. That's a prediction we can make from, from, from this. Um, another thing we would expect is that through the disassembly scenario, 
um, because the habitat itself harshens and it's harder to survive in that habitat, we could expect species that derive resources from outside the ex ecosystem to extend their persistence, to be able to like survive through that disassembly scenario longer than those organisms that get all of their resources from inside the system. So an example of that is um, air breathers versus water breathers. So this here is a fairy shrimp. Um, these are mosquitoes. Um, and this is a water boatman. Okay. Now, um, a fairy shrimp um, has gills. So right along here, there's its gills. Um, and it, it's a water breather. Um, if the water runs out of oxygen, while they do have good tolerances, you know, if the water completely runs out of oxygen, which is relatively common in these systems, they will die. Whereas a mosquito, as long as the thermal tolerance isn't uh, like reached, um, they have this little snorkel. It's right here, and it's basically an air tube where um, oxygen will passively diffuse into their body but what they're doing is they're deriving oxygen from the air and the air always has oxygen, right? Um, water boatmen do it a little differently. Um, they, um, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is not a water boatman. I just realized that. This is a back swimmer. I am sorry. Um, they're very similar. They're, they, they look almost identical. But, um, so, okay, a back swimmer. Water boatmen do the same thing, actually. But what they do is they have some hydrophobic hairs on their belly ba back here, uh, and they go to the surface and expose those hairs to um, to the air. And when they go underwater, then they basically hold a little bubble, and you can think of it as this like tiny little scuba tank. Uh, now, in times where the water has a lot of oxygen, the oxygen can actually just diffuse into that bubble, but if in times when the water has no oxygen, all they have to do is swim to the surface, expose those hydrophobic hairs back to this, uh, the water surface, and then it's like refilling their scuba tank and they can go back down and they can just come up to the surface whenever they want. So, you know, what's going to happen in a scenario where in a ha harshening habitat, we would expect things like fairy shrimp to go away first um, and then these other air breathers to pers persist longer in the system. Um, as these, these organisms are uh, experiencing this habitat harshening, they have to acclimate to that, right? And um, one of the things that we would expect would be like behavioral changes uh, to persist longer. So um, something that can just change its behavior very quickly would be able to persist a long time. But if something has to um, like change its body shape, um, the, the, we would expect them to be eliminated earlier in the system. So an example of this is uh, fairy shrimp versus clam shrimp. Um, both of them are water breathers, right? So they, they you know, use gills. Uh, the gills are in a different spot though. So, um, I mean, they're not really in a different spot, but if you look here, like these little strands here are the gills all, all in here, okay? And the gills beat their, their, um, uh, they're just kind of continuously drumming in there and bringing water through there. And it, it, um, it brings oxygen in and then they, you know, absorb that oxygen. Same thing happens with these, uh, these gills right there. The thing is, um, in low oxygen um, conditions, um, the all the clam shrimp can do is beat their their gills a little bit faster, whereas the the fairy shrimp can actually go to the top of the water. So, like like let's say the the water surface was right here, they'll go to the top of the water and then beat their gills really strongly. And what that does is it kind of agitates the water and continuously gets more water in that really localized area 
so that oxygen then will diffuse into that little that little pocket of water where its gills are and they can actually survive through a night um, of like low oxygen if there's a bunch of respiration going on in the system so while it is energetically expensive um, it, it you know it's what they have to do to get get oxygen and so thing like there this thing doesn't have any behavioral adaptations or behavioral I should just say behaviors that it can do. Um, the fairy shrimp though has this unique behavior that can allow them to persist longer as that habitat continues to get harsher and harsher. So finally then the meta community itself just disassembles. So let's say we do have a meta community here where we you know have um, a lot of immigration going between these two two pools, right? Real wide arrow, arrow here. Um, whereas the you know further pools and the smaller pools, we wouldn't expect as much um, uh, dispersal going on there. And then as it's then you know the all these pools are shrinking. Some of the pools will go away, and some of those um, you know dispersal corridors will completely go away. So. The meta community is now not really working as a meta community anymore. The less um, those those interactions between the um, between the different habitats are going away. So when you have less movement within that meta community, you'll have fewer a active colonization events throughout the meta community, which would then lower diversity. But that's from a different reason as opposed to before when we talked about um, diversity decreasing due to um, like habitat heterogeneity being lost. So I want to kind of bring this back to thinking about this permanent ecosystem, e permanent ecosystem disassembly versus the disassembly that we see in ephemeral ecosystems. When we're talking about like trees getting cut down and habitat being fragmented or an invasive species coming in, these are completely alien conditions that, that let's say a tropical rainforest has never had occur to it before. So trying to make predictions of what happens when a new species invades, I, d I don't even know if that is even really possible. It's, it's at least a tall order. We can make really, really generalized predictions, but it's still pretty hard to figure out what's going to go on. Contrast that then with ephemeral ecosystem disassembly, right? A, um, the organisms in these ponds, in these ephemeral ponds, have a long evolutionary history with the conditions of this assembly and disassembly and dry period. And to, to have an alternating wet and dry and wet and dry period, or potentially, you know, having years go, go on in between the, the wet periods, these organisms are adapted, they depend on these, these situations, and they can capitalize on these, these habitats because they have this long evolutionary history. So, you know, is, there, is this really even a disturbance to them? It you know might be a valid question. I don't even think having that um, you know community disassemble is necessarily a disturbance if they're relying on it to actually like keep their population persisting. The life cycles of of organisms in ephemeral wetlands are extremely fast, right? Tadpole shrimp can um, grow in seven days and have eggs on them within seven to nine days. Um, I've seen certain fairy shrimp species able to fully complete their life cycle in three days um, from water being added to you know having viable eggs being laid for three days and that that's crazy fast. So um, we don't necessarily need to wait a really 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 long time for these equilibrium conditions to be reached and they can um, go very quickly and have um, some of these um, s situations that y you would need very long time frames in um, permanent ecosystems to, to actually occur. <laughs>
Um, so these these organisms are expecting this disassembly. Now, expecting, you know, when we're talking about a fairy shrimp is a little hard word maybe to swallow, but you know, they're 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 adapted to it and depend on it. So all this being said is we should expect patterns to be more visible, more common in natural disassembly scenarios. And we should expect these patterns to just kind of be just way more apparent for us to be able to find and study. Those patterns then have the ability then to feed back to shape the community composition. So a species that is able to persist longer to you know survive this habitat harshening potentially for a longer time period we could expect them to continue to have a you know a higher dominance or be more common throughout the you know lifespan of and i'm talking like you know lifespan in the sense of a really long time um not just a single hydro period but to their their prevalence in each hydro period to be more dominant than something that oftentimes gets eliminated from the community very quickly. So the patterns that we see should feed back to shape that community in the future. Um, and all of this work um, was kind of kind of taking a lot of the work in my PhD dissertation and then like expanding it and I um, I'm happy to say that I got it published in the journal Ecology and it's um, uh, kind of a like a culmination of looking at um, a lot of what I was thinking about during my PhD dissertation and here's a couple pictures of me while I was out there working um, in in Colorado and then um, coming here in Wisconsin and kind of thinking about these ideas to put it in a more holistic general framework. All right, with that, that's the final lecture. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this class and um, get ready for the final, I guess.